Good evening, everybody. What a great crowd tonight. Thank you so much for coming out to join us at the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Lecture Series. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Zach. I am the Director of Education at Florida Oceanographic Society, and it's really my pleasure to, to have such an amazing audience here tonight at the Blake Library, as well as in, on Zoom. Hey, everybody watching at home from Zoom tonight. You guys are the heart of this lecture series. Without an amazing audience, I wouldn't be able to get world-class speakers to travel into our community. So really, all of our thanks goes to each and every one of you. Tonight's special guest speaker, Dr. Rich Aronson, grew up in Queens in New York. He holds a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and a PhD from Harvard University. He was a senior marine scientist at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab in Alabama before moving to Florida Tech, right up the road in Melbourne, in 2009. There, he's currently the head of the Department of Ocean Engineering and Marine Sciences. Using a combination of paleontology and ecology, Rich's research focuses on the response of ancient marine communities to climatic shifts. And in a way, this allows us to try to predict how today's rapidly changing environment and climate may impact modern species. His work is split between tropical coral reefs and the freezing cold world of Antarctica. Tonight, his program is gonna focus on his research in Antarctica. I am really excited to welcome to the stage Dr. Rich Aronson. Thank you everybody for coming out. It's great to see y'all. It's nice to be doing these things in person finally, right? Collective groan and sigh of relief. Yeah, so. And again, thank you everybody who's zooming in. Uh, we will uh, do our best to, uh, to have a good balance in the Q&A of, uh, of uh, audience and, and people zooming in. So um, I will say that I am uh, technologically challenged. So I'm going to uh, try not to drop this uh, microphone thing. I'll try not to drop this. I'll try not to fall off the stage. Although everybody loves a little physical comedy now and again. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes? OK, great. OK, so you know, I, I, I grew up in Queens, as, as Zach mentioned, and uh, I collected shells on Jones Beach. And uh, you know, and uh, anybody from New York? Huh? Yay, right, 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 yeah, OK. And I will say, just as an aside, my wife is from Boston, so it, it's, it, it's the Pats, unfortunately. I, you know, for those of you from New York, I am outvoted. So all right, anyway. So, you know, I always wanted to be a naturalist when I was growing up, and I used to sit there on Sunday evenings and watch, watch Wild Kingdom when, uh, when, I was, uh, you know, when I was a little kid and we had dinner and watched, watched this, and I thought, boy, this would be great to just beat up wildebeests on the Serengeti or something like that. This is just what it seemed like what they were doing, and it turns out I'm allergic to all these, these animals. And so, so then one day when I was... Uh, I was not supposed to be up late. I, I flipped on our old black and white TV box, and, and what popped on the screen was The Silent World, which was Jacques Cousteau's first film. And for those of you who've ever taken a photograph with film, and I, looking out at the audience, I suspect that there are a couple of you, um, you probably have heard of Trix movie film. It's, it's this grainy black and white film and I thought, oh my gosh, I gotta do this. And 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 so I did. And and what I did not sign up for, there, there's actually a point to this story. Um, what I didn't sign up for was was climate change. And now it, it's all climate change all the time. It's it is an emergency. I know I I'm preaching to the to the converted here. You know, you, you're all sensitized about this already, but but it really is a, a very serious issue and, and it's it is it is the threat. And so, so, you know, without going into the socio-political um, ramifications of this and that, I'll just say that, you know, the, we all know this is important. And what I do want to talk to you about today is, is climate change and marine life in Antarctica. Um, it takes exactly zero provocation for me to show my slides. I love doing that because I love taking photographs. And I love showing them off and, and telling stories and jokes and this and that. Um, I am going to do a lot of that. I'm also going to show you a few data. So bear with me. They're important. They, they kind of go along with the story. Okay? I, I 
going to try really hard not to bore you, OK? Do my best. So first of all, that, that's an iceberg, obviously. That is the last iceberg I saw after, after a trip to the Antarctic Peninsula in 2000. We're on our way back up to, uh, to Argentina. So just to situate you a little bit, and uh, uh, my understanding for the folks on Zoom is that you're not going to be able to see the points, so I'm sorry about that. Um, this white thing in the middle, that's Antarctica, of course. Um, it, it's a kind of an interesting place. So, so the Arctic and the Antarctic are very different, right? The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents, and the Antarctic is a continent surrounded by oceans. And that has big implications for marine life. And I just want to point out a couple of features to you. First of all, the area of Antarctica is, is, is roughly the size of, of North America, maybe, you know, or maybe, you know, the US and part of Canada, something like that. So it, it's a pretty good sized place. It's the highest, driest, and coldest place on Earth. Um, you can find that on any website from the National Science Foundation about Antarctica, and you'll get all the all the stats, it's, it's really quite something. What I also want you to see is this purpley line here. That is the Antarctic circumpolar current, it's also known as the west wind drift. And it whips around like this. Uh, and what you can see here is that there are no continents in the way. So the fetch is, is infinite. It just whips around and around and around. and uh, that's got some interesting consequences for climate, setting up gradients of climate, cold down in Antarctica and warm, you know, warmer as you move towards the tropics, and also has a somewhat isolating effect of Antarctica. It kind of, it produces a kind of a permeable barrier to, to organisms that might come in from the oceans that abut this area, which is the Southern Ocean. This thing is the Drake Passage. That's the passage between southern South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. That opened up around 41 million years ago. And that's one of the reasons, when some other things opened up, why you have this infinite fetch. You know, fetch is the distance, right? I mean, mostly probably been on the water a lot. So, so the result of that is that it can be absolutely freaking horrendous. Uh, and I'm not, I'm thinking of a different word when I say freaking, you know, but, but um, starting with the same first letter, but, but, um, but if, you know, this thing opened up and I just want to show you one photograph uh, from a time I went to Antarctica as a naturalist aboard a Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian travel, like ecotourism adventure. So get ready for it. There it is. Okay. Not so good. So on the, some of the times you go across the Drake, it's, it's fine. Some of the time you feel, eh, and then the big trick is to go have a big greasy breakfast and try to make other people throw up. And sometimes you're just leaning against the picture window, trying not to puke, but you just have to get the picture. And that's what I did. I was, it was one of these beautiful, um, well-appointed small cruise boats. And, uh, and there I was, there were 40-foot waves crashing over the bridge of this boat. That was a little scary, you know, and, and, and the, the, the captain of this boat was like 12 years old, you know, and, uh, you know, some, I mean, he was fabulous. You know, he wasn't 12 years old, but to me, he seemed like he was 12 years old. And, uh, and uh, you know, like cops, you know, 12 years old. They're all 12 years old, right? And so, so oh my God, we're taking off. Um, and so, so it can be really rough and, 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 and pretty amazing. But, but the rewards, of course, are, 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 you know, are quite wonderful. So climate change and polar environments, and I'm including the Arctic as well as the Antarctic. So first of all, species and the communities that they form, they're particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change in polar environments. First of all, the poles are warming faster than the rest of the planet. Just is the way it is. The water is also acidifying faster. Things are happening faster at the poles. And second of all, as if that weren't bad enough, there's a, what I'm going to call an evolutionary legacy 
of adaptation to a narrow set of environmental conditions, which is to say, if you live in a place for millions of years and the temperature doesn't change a whole lot, then when the temperature does start to change, that's going to be trouble, right? It's just kind of, kind of almost common sense. And I will show it, show it like this. This is a, a um, uh, for the, this is a, uh, a diagram of the envelope of seasonal ranges of temperatures at different latitudes. So up top is the tropics, all right? In the middle is the temperate, and down here is polar. So again, I grew up in New York. I well remember the winter of 1968. It was really cold. There's a huge amount of snow. I also remember the summers surrounding 1968. It was hot and sticky and awful, and the old joke, yeah, you could fry an egg on the sidewalk. So you get these enormous ranges of, of temperature in the temperate zone. In contrast, if you go down to the poles, so this is Antarctica, and this is in the tropics, within a community, or let's say within a coral reef in the tropics, or at some little spot uh, in, in Antarctica, the annual range of temperature is a lot narrower. And in fact, in the poles, it's really narrow. So you jump into the water in Antarctica, let's say at McMurdo Station down in the Ar Antarctic Circle, it's going to be minus 1.8 degrees centigrade. Right? That's butt cold, right? It's really cold. The freezing point of seawater is minus 2 centigrade, right? And it's lower than fresh water, right? Because it's got salt in it, right? So so it's, but it, it, the temperature doesn't really vary that much from there. So that's in the summertime and in the wintertime. On coral reefs, the range is a little bit, a little bit broader. And I, I show this to, to illustrate a couple of points. First of all, the organisms that are going to live in the temperate zone, they're what we call eurythermal. That means that they, they tolerate a broad range of temperatures. But if you look at the extremes of latitude, they're going to be stenothermal, which means they tolerate a narrow set of temperatures. And that means when the temperature gets outside of their comfort zone, as it were, there's going to be trouble, right? Extinction or whatever. And this explains why I work on both on coral reefs and in Antarctica. Now, I could you know, sit here and masquerade by saying, well, ha, ha, I knew this all the time, and that's why I chose to work in these two places. Of course, that's not true. Um, both, of these, both of these extremes of latitude have narrow temperature ranges, have organisms that are adapted to those narrow temperature ranges. right? And so when things go the wrong way, in other words, get warmer, they're, they're much less able to cope ecologically and evolutionarily than things in the temperate zone, which are used to this enormous range. So, so that's how, what it, you both, the, 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 the kind of didactic or intellectual point about this. And then also, just to tell you, I was just drawn to these two, these extremes of latitude, because I kind of had this intuition that they were, they were both places where climate change would manifest itself ecologically sooner and more, uh, more dramatically than, than in the temperate zone. So again, as I said, I could say, oh, yes, I knew this all along. Of course, I didn't know this all along. I saw this diagram that when we put it together, oh, yeah, that's why I did that. Got it now. It's smart, right? So OK, now, what's going on in Antarctica? Summertime temperatures off the western Antarctic Peninsula, that dark red stuff, they've gone up 1 and a half degrees centigrade in the last 50 years. That's Double the global average. And these are just diagrams from different depths of the ocean. This is SST, which is sea surface temperature, right? And so it's gotten hot very quickly in Antarctica. And again, you know, it's not, you know, it's not just all of Antarctica gets hot. It's, you know, it, it not only is Antarctica warming in general, but different places get get warmer faster, right? It's just it's patchiness, as they call it in ecology. I will say that it's complicated in time. After 1998, temperatures stabilized off the Western Peninsula. Then they declined. And the wisdom is that this, that's a temporary 
thinking that they will then start ramping up again. So, so it, it's all over the place. Of course, makes it real fun to talk to people who are a little skeptical about climate change. Just like saying, you know, just you know, just is what it is, right? I mean, science is about uncertainty, and people want certainty. Well, it's not so easy, right? So anyway, the point is, it's getting hot really fast in Antarctica, and some of the consequences. I, you know, I, uh, Zach was asking, are you going to show some? Shots of penguins. Of course, I'm showing photographs of penguins. Because everybody loves penguins. All right, raise your hand if you don't like penguins. All right, oh, one person. OK. All right, how many people like penguins? OK, all right, hands down. How many people abstain? Uh, no abstentions. OK, all right, so sorry, sir, so you're, you're outvoted here. Um, so we are going to talk about penguins. Um, so these are three species of penguins, small penguins in the Antarctic Peninsula. This is the Adelie. That's the one that, you know, with the tuxedo and the bow tie, right? You know, if uh, um, anybody actually remembers the cartoon, Tennessee Tuxedo, right? Right? Yay, right? OK, uh, this one's a Gentoo, and this one's a Chinstrap. And so what we've been noticing is that, is that these, this purple line, that's the number of breeding pairs of a daily penguins. That these ones, they're going down the chutes. And then, so they've gone from 15,000 colonies down to around 4,000 colonies from 1970 to around 2005, right? So it's a little while ago now. These other two species, well, the chin straps, they're kind of doodling along. They've increased to some extent, and, and uh, they've, uh, you know, they, they've kind of stabilized. Different colonies do different things. And then these Gentoo penguins are going up. Now, for the Gentoos and the chin straps, this is the scale. Here's 20,000, here's 1,000. So, so these other two species are not going up as much as, as the Adelias are going down, right? Now, why could this be? You're probably thinking, well, Rich is here to talk about climate change, so maybe it's about climate change. Well, it is kind of about climate change. This is what Adelie penguins eat. They eat krill, right? Everybody knows krill is whale food and penguin food. And krill live under the ice, and krill eat the algae that grows under the ice that falls off. They're filter feeders. So here's a lovely cartoon from a textbook about it. Um, it's kind of like Wallace and Gromit, but I'm not going to go there. Um, but so here's, here's the algae under the ice. All this gunk is coming down. The krill are eating that, and the penguins are eating, are eating the krill. And penguins, the, the, these are daily penguins. Adelies, they do eat other stuff. And in fact, I, I do have to. Just say at this point, if you are lucky enough to go to Antarctica and you see a daily penguins, if you see David Attenborough with these penguins, they're, they're about the cleanest things in the world. These things are absolutely filthy. They're covered with poo. And the reason they're covered with poo is that they sit there on the rocks and they don't want to poo in their own nest, so they stick their butts up and then bam, right in the chest. You heard that from the microphone, right? And it's like, what did I do? You know? And so you can always tell what these things are eating by, you know, if it's gray, it's fish and squid. You know, if it's red, it's going to be krill. Just, just a little hint in case you, you want to go out there, know what these things are eating without, you know, kind of putting your finger down their throats and, and making them puke, right? So, of course, it's much more complicated than that. It's in part climate change. It's also incredibly the ban on whaling. So as the whales came, are coming back, they're eating krill. They're actually competing with these adelies. And so, so although the adelies are you know, declining, the other species are not increasing as much because it's not just about climate. It's about, it's about the food supply. Those other two species do better in warmer water. All I'm saying is that climate is one of a number of things that's going on on the planet. I, I know by the fact that nobody's saying anything, you're absolutely shocked to hear that, right? So it's a joke. Um, so anyway, just, just know that. So these are what we call bottom-up effects of climate change. That means the algae, the sunlight grows the algae, the algae grow up, they feed the krill, the krill feeds the penguins, so on and so on. So, so part of this bottom-up impact is climate change. So the bottom fauna is, is more of a top-down story. So there's a physical imp impact here, and then there's a uh, then, and then there's a biological impact. I just want to rip through the, the direct physical impacts first. Impacts of rising temperatures. First of all, 
If you are a cold-blooded organism, which a penguin is not, but if you're a fish, let's say, you have a double problem as the temperature goes up. First of all, as the temperature goes up, you need more oxygen, right? Because you gotta breathe, because your muscles, your enzymes are moving faster. At the same time, you got another problem, and that is that the seawater can hold less oxygen, right? So just, you know, you can do this at home, right? You open a soda, right? Put it on the stove, pretty soon you got a flat soda, right? Just blows off all the carbon dioxide, right? So the solubility of these gases declines as the temperature goes up. So the result of that is gonna be range shifts, which is to say an animal that's living in the northern part of the peninsula, they're gonna start drifting, you know, generation by generation to the south. And that's actually what's happening with those Adelie penguins, in fact, not just with these cold-blooded things, right? But remember what I said about Antarctica being a continent surrounded by ocean, right? At some point, they're going to bang into the continent, and there's no further south they can go, and then that could potentially lead to extinctions. So that's a, those are kind of direct impacts of, of temperature. There are some indirect impacts of, of, of temperature, um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. And what that is, what I want to talk to you about is, is how temperature effects on predators have an impact on what's going on in Antarctica. So that was a pretty long windup, I know, but here we go. So here are my questions. What's unique about food web structure of seafloor communities in Antarctica? How did past climate change alter that structure? And, and what, what's going to happen in the future? And I want to start with this first one. And because I'm from New York, I'm going to start talking faster and faster and faster. So, so get ready. All I got to say is buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. OK, so the kinds of predators that you see in modern marine communities, bony fish, modern sharks and rays, the kinds that you see around today, and modern crustaceans like crabs and lobsters and mantis shrimps, you don't see them in Antarctica. And it's interesting that everywhere else they structure communities. So it's a top-down thing. They eat the next thing, and then the next thing is less abundant, so the thing below that gets more abundant, and the thing below that is less abundant, bing, 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 down the, down the food chain. All of those predators, they're fast-moving predators that are able to crush shells, and they are groups of animals that, that, that diversified starting in the Mesozoic era. What does that mean? That's the time of the dinosaurs. So they're after the Paleozoic era. And so in the Mesozoic, all kinds of things are happening, and those those, those diversifications, or as we call them, evolutionary radiations, they have percolated through the big, the big asteroid impact in the Yucatan 65 million years ago and continued on to this day. OK, in Antarctica, it's different. This is one of these antifreeze fish. They actually have antifreeze compounds in their blood. They sit around. There are no, no crabs or lobsters, no sharks or rays. And these bony f fish. On the shelf, they're called notothenioids or, or, or antifreeze fish. They only eat beach hoppers, these little amphipods. Why? Because their teeth are just loosely, loosely sunk into their gums. They're just kind of floating around. So they just can't do it. OK. Now, what are the consequences of these changes in predation? Well, if you go to a shell shop, and I'm sure everybody's been to, a, to, to look at, a, at the seashells in a shell shop, Mostly what you're seeing is, is, is shells from the Philippines, unfortunately. And most of them look something like this. They're, they're very well, well um, decorated architecturally. And all those architectural attributes are, are anti-predator um, anti devices. So they basically they increase the, the effective diameter of the, of the shell so that a fish can't get its mouth around it. Or they have a, a very narrow aperture, that's the, where, the, where the snail comes out, um, and that's to keep crabs from trying to peel back the, um, um, peel back the, um, the, the shell and eat the insides. So that's in the tropics, and this is actually a mix of Pacific and, and Atlantic shells. In the temperate zone, you'll see something like this. Let's say you go to, go to I don't know, Maine or Assateague Island or something like that. You know, on the Atlantic seaboard, um, you're going to see something like this. So they're moderately 
well defended. And then if you go to Antarctica, they're very poorly defended. The shells are a lot thinner. And this one's got some ribs. This one doesn't look like much at all and would potentially be much more easily crushed by a predator. And those latitudinal gradients, that gradient in, um, in architecture is a result of two things. First of all, it's very hard to lay down a molecule of calcium carbonate in cold weather. It takes more energy to do it than in the tropics. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the evolutionary pressure to do that is less because of no predators, right? And so as it happens, a recent study argued pretty forcefully that, that this is the, the main driver, that it's actually not that much more difficult to, to lay it down in energetic terms, to lay it down in the, you know, in, in, at the poles. But, but in fact, this is mostly about predation pressure. OK, so that's evolution. Let's talk about ecology. And now you get to see some cool slides of Antarctica. I want to take you right down here to McMurdo Sound. This is deep in the Antarctic Circle. Um, this is the Ross Sea. And it's an old Navy base that's converted to scientific use. It's our toehold in Antarctica, our biggest, biggest toehold there. So um, if you want to go diving, as I did get to do, uh, it uh, takes about eight hours to do two half hour dives. So it's a big investment, right? I mean, you have to get up in the morning. Of course, you have, to have a lot of coffee, right, to get started. And then, of course, you know what comes after having a lot of coffee, right, which is bad when you have all your, your diving suit on. But in any event, running swiftly past those details, um, you get to drive a tractor, which is really cool. I mean, you know, Antarctica, is, it's like you can do anything. The only thing they, you can drive a snowmobile, you can fly an helicopter, you can fly in a military transport thing. You can, you can do all this cool stuff. The only reason, thing that they don't have, it's really unfortunate, they don't have trains. You can't drive a train. They just don't have any trains there. But, but for everybody's you know, childhood fantasies, like, this is great here, you know. Um, so anyway, when you go diving, you take one of these tractors out to a, a, a little, this, this orange hut. It's a diving hut. That's a big, a big can of diesel there, and there's a stove there. And you go inside, and the first thing you do once you've unloaded all your stuff is you have hot chocolate, right? Then you got to pee, and you got to run outside, take everything off. To, put it all back on, go back inside, and eventually you get ready to dive. And this is what it looks like diving. They drill a hole in the ice. The ice is 10 foot thick, right? And you jump in this little hole, and you think, a good idea would, not, would be not to screw this up, you know? Because you could have a lot of trouble. So you go down the hole, and it's like, it's like going down an elevator shaft. You're just like, boop, and you burp out the other side. That, that's, that's the actual evidence that I went diving in Antarctica. Um, and it's, it's really quite something. They have a shot line with a checkered flag. You can, the visibility is like 400 feet. So this is really easy to see what you're doing. And you basically, um, if I may say, you basically drop down the hole. You pop out into this inky, inky darkness because the, the snow on top of the ice is reflecting all the light. So it's actually pretty dark down there. And then you just you kind of tumble ass over tea kettle down, down to the bottom, and, and, and you start looking around. And this is the kind of thing you see. Really spectacular, right? So this is, these are these beautiful starfish. That, those are worms. That's a, a soft coral. There's a bunch of lovely things in here. There's some sea urchins. But what's really, you know, oh, there's an anemone, right? There's beautiful things. And you know, this is my own shots, you know? And then this crazy worm. And these are not toothpicks. They're very soft, actually, really kind of kind of nice. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, have one as a pet, but, you know, nice. Nice enough, right? But what's really cool about this is if you look at the predators in Antarctica on the bottom, 100 feet down around McMurdo, they're all, they're all invertebrates. So that's the sea star. These are these great big disgusting ribbon worms, and they're, they, they're just, bleh, you know, you put them on your suit, and they, they've got this acid mucus. They leave a scar on your suit, so don't recommend it. And uh, you, you learn. You learn some things, right? Sea spider, and then this enormous, uh, enormous uh, annelid worm. And they're all predators, but they are all predators that evolved before the Mesozoic. They're Paleozoic predators. They all evolved before the time that the crabs and the fish and the sharks diversified. So that's kind of an interesting thing, right? If you look at what the consequences appear to be of not having fast moving bone crushing predators, Everybody on the bottom 
looks like a filter feeder. They're just standing on top there, uh, on top of the, on top of the surf, the sediment, you know, the, the sand bottom, and they're just waving their arms. We are the world, la 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 la, catching, catching food, right? And, and uh, you know, and they're not worried why, because there's no predators. And so here's a, you know, this is like the archetypal example for me. Whoops, for me. Here's this is one of these antifreeze fish. Here's a whole bunch of brittle stars. You know, if you were in, in Massachusetts, these things wouldn't even be anywhere near this fish. They'd be hiding somewhere. But they don't care because this thing's got these teeth that just kind of wobble around its mouth, not eating it. So it's a very different kind of vibe diving around here. The other thing you see a lot of is these brachiopods. They're lamp shells, and that's really unusual. You don't see this in most places um, in the world, ocean and shallow water environments. And the crowning craziest thing about this is that there is an animal there. It's called an isopod. It's like a roly-poly, right? Related to roly-polies, right? Or, or a pill bug, same thing, right? Marine pill bug. That looks for all the world like a trilobite. And, and that's just nuts. And it, it, so it, it all has this very sort of retrograde or archaic feel to it. And if you go and look in the fossil record, that's the kind of thing you see from the Paleozoic on these soft bottom communities. This is a beautiful little block from, uh, from the Smithsonian. These are a couple of shots that I took in research. I got this actually out of a, a, a limestone quarry in Illinois. And it's covered with these brachiopods, just looking not that different from that, right? So this is a, a reconstruction of what those Paleo Paleozoic seas looked like. Um, the, the person who did this, it was a series of paintings, Hungarian artist named Burian. If you want to see his work, go to the, the Florida Museum of Natural History. He's got a whole series of paintings of, of what it looked like in the Great Basin of the United States, North America, um, much younger than this. It's absolutely spectacular. This is what he, what he did. He did paintings of what life was like in times past. But same thing, sea lilies and brachiopods and trilobites and all that stuff. These are uh, octopus relatives. OK, so where would you see these kinds of things today? Well, you could go into the deep sea and look at them. These are crinoids or sea lilies. This is the Necton Gamma, one of the subs that I've used in the Bahamas to go take a look at these things. Um, notice the incredibly high-tech milk crate that's stuck on the front end of the thing. If you're also careful, you can see we have some spaghetti colanders to pick things up, you know. And they're attached high-tech with duct tape. All right. The other thing we did was we went off North Carolina, um, off Cape Hatteras. And this is the Johnson Sea Link. It's a, it's, was, was stationed right not far from here uh, for quite some time. Um, and you can see all these brittle stars, again, in deep waters, right? So they're deep water environments. You see these dense populations of some of these animals. And I did look in at one spot in the Bahamas. It was actually my dissertation research. And uh, no fish, lots and lots of these brittle stars, right? Happen to be pretty pretty um, obsessed about brittle stars, and, and so you're going to hear a lot about them uh, in a minute. And then there's this crazy stuff. This is around the British Isles. These beautiful things are actually related to those ones I just showed you. Lots and lots of brittle stars. This is right off the Isle of Man, right over here. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's what do you see? The kinds of predators you see are these starfish and other slow-moving, kind of archaic kinds of predators. And, here, the starfish is moving through these brittle stars. They were so slow moving, blah, blah. They're not that slow moving. Once these things get going, the way these brittle stars detect the starfish is they smell its BO and they go Bleh! like that and they go, they don't, they don't make that noise, of course, but you can just, you know, they got like three neurons anyway, you know, and, and uh, you know, and they're, they're running away as fast as they can. Okay. So that's where you see some of these Paleozoic type communities, right? Brachiopods, those lamp shells, you do see them a lot. You see them a lot, particularly in the southern hemisphere. And you kind of wonder, that doesn't fit in with this idea that you, you, know, you don't want to, you know, without shell-crushing predators, you would get these, these kind of archaic elements. But it's a little weird. They seem to be resistant to predation. They have protective shells. This, they taste like, you know, I, I, I'll say they taste like crap. You know I'm thinking of a different word, right? It does not start with the letter C. And uh, 
they're more common in the southern hemisphere. So, so there's something going on, apart from Antarctica itself, there's also something weird going on with the southern hemisphere compared with the northern hemisphere. It's another kind of interesting mystery. Okay, so basically the point I want you to get out of here is that shell press crushing predators are absent. Seafloor is populated by filter feeders and mollusks that are not very well defended against predators. And the predators are these slow-moving invertebrates with Paleozoic credentials. And so the Antarctic bears analogies to the Paleozoic, again, time before the dinosaurs, and deep sea communities. That's what I want you to get out of there. How did past climate change alter the structure of these food webs? Well, here we go. So I have to show you this. This is like, I don't know how many of you have read Captain Underpants to your young relatives, right? Before I tell you that story, I have to tell you this story, right? Does anybody remember this? <sighs> All right. I try so hard. All right, so here's the Paleozoic, right? That runs from about 543 to about 250 million years ago. And then the Mesozoic, 250 to 65, and that's when the big asteroid clunked into the Earth. And then the Cenozoic from, from then to the present. The Paleozoic, here's the Holocene. That's the current time that we're in. And I'm trying to analogize Antarctica to the Paleozoic. That's what I was, was, was talking to you about. But what I want to do now is take you over here to the Eocene about 30 to 50 million years ago and tell you about some stuff that we found that's the first little inklings of this shift and, and, and this, this trend towards cold weather in Antarctica that gave us this weird sort of retrograde type of um, fauna that we have today. So now I want to take you up here to Seymour Island, which is, is right near the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is what it looks like. There it is. Yeah, there's a little map of it. One thing you got to notice here, no snow, right? I mean, it's, it's in a snow shadow. So the peninsula is over here and, 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 or, or over here. Moist winds come in from the west. They get lofted up by the mountains on the peninsula. Snow comes down. It's just like the, the western desert in, in, in America, right? It's a, it's a snow shadow instead of a rain shadow. So it turns out to be the absolutely best place in Antarctica to collect lots and lots of cool fossils. Here it is again, and this is what the landscape looks like. It's pretty, pretty spare, right? Not much going on. And we're up here at the northern end. This is right up here where we want to... Uh, we want to do our thing. This is a big plateau. That's where the Argentines have an air base, and we were their guests on one of our expeditions. And here it is. This is, this is kind of a, like an expansive view. There's one of our campsites and a couple of people. It's a giant pile of stuff, and it, it is a submarine channel fill. So that means there's a channel, a channel running through that area. A bunch of stuff got deposited, and then at some point it got uplifted by earthquakes. Right? Okay, so that's what we got. And it runs from about 55 to about 33 million years ago. So the first thing you see on the lower reaches is petrified wood. Really cool. What's even cooler about it, apart from that it's very heavy if you want to have it in your living room, you know, you, you're kind of on your own, right? But what's really cool is that it's the same tree as the southern beech, which is this very common tree in New Zealand and, and, uh, and Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. So, so it's the same thing, right? And it's pretty clear that what that means is that at least earlier on, like 50-ish million years ago, it was a cool temperate environment in Antarctica on the peninsula. These trees that are growing, grow, 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 and then they fell over for whatever reason, washed out to sea, got waterlogged. They didn't make that noise, but they went down there, they sank down there, and then they, they, they got mineral replacement, came up, and then along comes Rich Aronson, picks them up, you know, staggers off with them, sticks them in his living room, right? So, so that's, that's notophagus. But the main thing that you see through most of the, the formation is clams. And this is one of our collaborators, Linda Ivany, she's a geochemist. And there are a lot of clams. And if you go, let's say, you know, go to Jones Beach in, in Long Island or Revere Beach up north of Boston or wherever you want to go in, in the northeast, you know, you go on the beach, a lot of clams, right? A lot of clam shells. Well, 
That's kind of what we got here. So, so there's nothing much abnormal about that. It looks like a fairly modern sort of a place, except that in certain places, you see those brachiopods. Remember, the ones that taste like crap, right? And uh, they look like these funny little pumpkin seeds. And uh, so that's one thing. And another thing that you're going to see are these rocks that are full of brittle stars. Now, you know where I'm going with this, right? And then crinoids, these sea lilies, right? It's just, it's, you know, you start thinking, huh, some of this looks a little bit retrograde to me, right? And you can tell how much these things have gotten, gotten attacked by predators by how many of their arms are regenerating. You can tell it in the fossils as well as in the modern, right? This one's pretty bad shape. You know, my PhD advisor says, yes, Ernest Hemingway took the picture of farewell to arms, right? Now, that is a good joke. Come on. That's a little, come on. You know, as they say, I'm here all week. Well, actually, I'm just here tonight. But, but uh, anyway, so you can take a look at, at these, these, these regenerating arms and use them as an index of predation pressure. And what you see is predation is very low on those animals. And the question is, how do those animals distribute themselves through time. They're low predation populations. How are those populations distributed through time? Well, this is a temperature graph of, of you don't see temperature. This is, this is a proxy for temperature. This is a, a temperature graph for this part of Antarctica. And there's a couple of things here you don't have to worry about. This is a missing, unconformity means there's just a missing section here. But what you see is right around here, this is when the Drake Passage opens up. This is Miko, the, the Middle Eocene climatic, climatic Optimum. That means it was warm, right? And then right when the Drake opens, the temperature takes a dive. Okay? So that's kind of interesting. Now you can plot where you see, where you see, um, you, where you see these various kinds of fossils. And again, I'll just remind you, here's the Drake Passage again. Opens up 41 million years ago causes all kinds of interesting changes. Well, they're all above this thing. So they're, they're at, this is the first cooling jag in Antarctica. And it happens 41 million years ago. And all of a sudden, boom. There are all these brittle stars and all these sea lilies and all this funny stuff. It just, they just show up. And you don't find them below. So that's kind of interesting. But if you look at brachiopods, they're above and below. Why is that? Brachiopods taste like crap. They don't care. but we think that this is about declining predation as it gets cooler. Well, it turns out that it's not as simple as that. It's about seasonality. There's a drop in summertime temperature at, uh, at, uh, at 41 million years ago. So the seasonality goes down. This is a very broad sort of there's summer and winter. And here, it's just kind of more like winter conditions, which is saying the same thing. The temperature goes down. And what we think is happening is that, is that predation levels, the, the amount of stuff that, you know, pressure that was exerted on these prey items, they got, they were, uh, they were kind of normal, if you will, like you would see today in the temperate zone for a while. So from about 46 million years ago up to 41 million years ago or so. And then cooling kind of deactivated and made them move more slowly. And then at some point, some point after our fossils, they went extinct. And in fact, you can plot the ranges of all kinds of stuff at this one little place, Seymour Island, and you see some stuff that kind of makes sense. Well, first of all, here's the crab story that I was just telling you about. Here are the brittle stars and the sea lilies. Here's the petrified wood. This is notophagus, goes away, right? It's all starting to make sense, right? N sharks of various kinds, like nurse sharks, which feed on the bottom on snails, they seem to go away or at least get less abundant. Bony fish get less abundant. We think it's possible that these ice fish evolved at this time. Penguins, they don't show up till it's cool, right? That makes sense. And then these snail shells, they're real ridgy and defended beforehand. And as it gets cool and predation gets lower, they get smoother, right? So there's all this stuff going on once it all, oh yeah, and there's a little froggy there that only shows up before it gets cold, right? Frogs don't like it to be cold, right? So. So there is, so the, all these, these, these changes, they kind of make sense. And they all happen across this, this first major cooling event. So again, predation pressure goes down. You see these dense brittle star and uh, sea lilies. 
and then undefended gastropods, snails. The snails, they have less sculpture, and there's no effect on brachiopods. Why? I shouldn't, I don't need class participation, because they taste like crap, right? Okay, so, so now we know why Antarctica is weird, how it started, it was cooling. So what's next? Well, we saw this before, right? There are no large predators that crush shells, and you're going to ask why not, right? And the answer, it's crazy. First of all, in general, m the performance of muscles is a lot worse when it's cold. So that's one thing, right? So you're not going to be able to bite as hard. But there's other stuff. There are, there's a series of weird historical accidents, which is to say accidents of evolution. There are contingencies. So it just so happens that those antifreeze fish in Antarctica, they never, they never evolved somebody who would go out and crush, crush, sea, crush snails, real stars, things like that, like you would see in the Arctic, where you have these, like this is called a winter flounder. They, it's a flounder, right? What do flounders eat? They eat sea urchins and, and, and snails and this and that, right? And they both have these same antifreeze AFGPs, which are, called, which are antifreeze glycoproteins. So it's not about the, about the antifreeze. It just never worked out. Those notothenoids, there's a barracuda-like thing. That's the Antarctic toothfish, right? Related to the Chilean sea bass, which you should not eat because it's not sustainable. Um, there are ones that look like little blennies and gobies. There are all these different kinds of things, but they never got something like a wrasse or, or, you know, or something like that, that would, or a cod, a real cod that would, that would, would crush. Okay? So, so that's one historical accident. It just never happened for no, you know, no particular reason. It just, just didn't happen. Okay. How come crustaceans? Crustaceans, the big crustaceans, the crabs, the lobsters, king crabs, and some of these other things like the, like the mantis shrimp, they got a little problem with magnesium. It's crazy to, 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 to say it, but they have a problem with magnesium. Um, magnesium is no more abundant in seawater in Antarctica than anywhere else, but these animals, they can't flush it out of their blood. They just can't do it. Why? I don't know, but they can't. And what does that do? Magnesium's a narcotic, and it knocks them out. So they can't operate. On the other hand, krill and uh, uh, shrimps and those beach hoppers, they have no problem flushing this stuff out. There's about a bajillion of them in Antarctica, right? So it's a little bit odd. And how many of you have used Epsom salts, right? What do you use it for? Soaking your feet, right? Yep. Why? It's, it's a narcotic or an anesthetic, right? The other use for Epsom salts, it's a magnesium sulfate, cures constipation. Same reason, right? Gets you in a relaxed state of mind, right? And state of intestine, right? So, so that's what it is. And if you're a, a marine biologist and you want to uh, do something about, um, you want to um, preserve some animals, right? and you don't want them to be all squinched up like that, you throw them in Epsom salts first, because the magnesium, it's a narcotic, knocks them out, gets them nice and relaxed, and then you kill the poor little suckers, right? Okay, I mean, there's no other way to say it. I could say it in a more sanitized way. So, as it happens, crabs and lobsters can't flush magnesium, and they die at temperatures less than one degree. It, it, it makes them pass out, their heart stops, they fall over, don't make the noise, but they do fall over, okay? King crabs, like world's deadliest catch, which are actually related to hermit crabs more than they are related to regular old crabs, they have the magnesium problem, but they can tolerate, tolerate a little better, and they just stand around like this. Ugh. And again, they don't make the noise, but they do stand around like that. Um, and then these other groups, they don't have the problem at all, and they're all over the place. So why am I telling you all this? First of all, you got to ask yourself, is the Antarctic circumpolar current a barrier to invasion from the north? Why on earth would I show this slide if the answer was no? Of course the answer is yes, right? If you look at the, at the eddy fields, these are the little swirlies 
in, in this big current, they're particularly prominent in the Drake, which is the closest, closest distance between Antarctica and South America. And what that means is that, is that, is that larvae can get stuck in these little swirls and they can come back in. Just like the Gulf Stream, everybody thought that, that the Antarctic Circumpolar Current was this wall, which is ridiculous. I mean, if you look at the Gulf Stream, it's full of holes. Likewise, this Antarctic Circumpolar Current, yep, as it turns out, they're getting in. Well, right now, they get in in water that's warm from the South Pacific. It goes through, gets a, gets a, a, a ring around it of cold water, and then eventually the whole thing dissipates. They freeze to death at some point. They're not going to freeze to death, right? So that's important. In addition, there are crabs, king crabs, that are living in the shallowest portions of the deep sea off Antarctica, so somewhere between 700 and 2,000 meters depth. And there's several species of them. This is what we know, the reports that we know about them. There's several of them. This is the one I'm going to be concentrating on. But they're, they're out there. And so I want to take you on a little oceanographic cruise now to the Western Peninsula. We were over here. We were over here. Now we're going to go over here. And I want to take you on this cruise. It was a joint Swedish-American cruise with a couple of ships. This is the American ship. It's the Gulf. And we went down from, from Chile all the way down and eventually wound up in McMurdo. But we used this sled. It's called Sea Sled. It comes out of Woods Hole Oceanographic. And it is a camera package that you tow in the deep sea. It takes hours to drop it down into the deep sea. You tow it along. It takes hours to lift it back up. And you can analyze the frames that you get in there. And you see all these king crabs. And they're all sitting there at the shallow end of the deep sea. There are a bunch of them doodling along. Here are some of them um, in a pre-copulatory embrace, uh, which translates to they're screwing, right? And man, now I got to laugh, right? And then the other thing that's kind of interesting to know about them is they have their claws are just like a regular lobster claw, even though they're in Antarctica, where it's hard to lay down calcium carbonate. So, well, here they are in, in, in the deep sea environment, and they seem to be creeping up as the temperature warms in Antarctica. The inner shelf could be warm enough for them this century. Right now, it is warm enough the outer portion of the continental shelf was about 500 meters for them to be up there. They seem to be creeping their way up there. It's possible within 50-ish years that inshore, like right near shore, they'll be able to, 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 to do it. Why aren't they on the outer shelf now? Well, population genetics are suggesting two things. First of all, maybe they may be recent. This is analyzing the genetics, like taking 50 of these things and throwing them in a blender and exactly like that, but doing up their genetics and, and seeing how similar they are genetically to each other. Well, they're very similar to each other genetically, which means a bottleneck, which means a recent colonization event. So they're fairly recent, and they have also got the potential from this genetic analysis to expand as it warms up. So what we think happened initially is that these king crabs, they were somewhere, this is, this is the continental shelf. This is what's called the continental slope. This is, in the, this is South America, and this is the western Antarctic Peninsula. Here they are. They're down here. Do, 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 do. The water is just a hair warm enough for them to be fine. Right? As it happens, it's weird in Antarctica oceanographically because here's the South Pacific, nice and warm. Here's the western Antarctic Peninsula. It's cold. They mix together, they down well, and then the water comes up again over here. And what the result of that is, is that if you go up top here, it's colder than if you go a little bit deeper down here, which is really weird oceanographically. Most places, right, you start on the surface, let's say you go to North Carolina. As you go down, it gets colder. Here it's inverted, right? So what that means is that it's too cold for these crabs right now, but what we think happened is that going through the Drake, these things, they bounced along these, um, these seamounts. And I literally mean bounce. They're, they're larvae, actually. They, they, they live close to the bottom. They kind of ding along the bottom. And 
you know, as I like to say, crabs. They got legs, they can walk, right? You know? So we think this is what happened. And then at some point, they made it to the shallowest portions of the deep sea, which is what I got represented here. And then again, they got some potential to pop up like that. So I'm going to go past this. So reinvasion of, of, of the shallow sea in Antarctica. Well, we talked about larvae getting in. We talked about these king crab populations. There's a third avenue of reinvasion, and that is expanding ship traffic. So ships, they take on ballast water, right? They take water into their tanks to keep them steady in the water. And along with that, they take in larvae, right? And so if they do what they're not supposed to do, which is get rid of all this ballast water in Antarctica, they potentially, they can introduce uh, um, invasive species. And that's what's maybe happening over here at Deception Island. This is, it's a volcanic caldera. The British military who were stationed there, they, they've, they've often pointed out that it looks like a toilet seat with good reason. And, but it's an interesting place because it's geothermally heated for one thing. So here are a bunch of penguins taking a steam bath, right? And it's a great place for tourist ships. They go in there, right? They get pit in the sand. Everybody gets in a bathing suit, lies and gets warm. Goes, oh, ha, ha, here I am in geothermally heated in, in Antarctica. But what's really super interesting is that a National Geographic photographer some years ago was doodling around on this very beach here in this upper part and found a crab. And it must have been something that came in the ballast tanks of one of those tourist ships. There's no other really clear way it could have gotten in. So that's kind of cool. Well, I showed you this business of these crabs not being able to tolerate magnesium. As it happens, that crab can tolerate lower, can, 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 you know, can flush out magnesium better than these other crabs. OK, last point I want to make for you is that there's another crab that's globally invasive. It's the European king crab. Now, these. Crabs on the left, these things, they just eat a little bit of crud on the bottom. That's all they do, right? These things, Carcinus minus, the European green crab, is a voracious predator. It is globally invasive, and it is raising hell all around the world. It's in the southern part of South Africa. It's in, uh, it's in southern, southern South America. It's all over the place. And this is what it looks like, and it is mean, and it is very, very predatory. So I think this is going to be the next, the next big predator into Antarctica. OK, so prediction. Well, you know, here's the depressing part. Predators are coming back in. You know, basically, it took them a while to get knocked out by cooling temperatures. Now we're just running the whole thing in rapid reverse. Predators have an entree to get back in. It's a much more complicated story than that. But the cartoon version is that that's what they're doing and what they may be set to do is to homogenize the, the bottom communities, the seafloor communities in Antarctica with what we see everywhere else around the world. Now, does that make a difference to the economy? No, it doesn't make a difference to the economy. It's, you know, it's the usual thing. What kind of a world do you want to live in? And I'm just going to leave it at that, right? I mean, we've got to make some choices, right? Would we take Michelangelo's statue of David and throw it in the dumpster because it's not good, not especially good for the economy? It doesn't do anything for the economy. Of course not, right? I mean, this is these, we have to make some choices as a society. So policy recommendations, just the usual thing. You have to do local and global action together, right? So local action, control ship traffic. Global action, control carbon. And it's just, it's just pure logic. If you solve the local things, then the global things take over as the most important. If you solve the global things, then the local things become the most important, right? It's just, again, it's logic. So, Last thing, trend is not destiny, right? It's all depressing. That doesn't mean you don't fight, right? So this, is, uh, it's been a, this quote has been attributed to a lot of people. This is the earliest, the earliest um, statement of this trend. Is, you know, so you know, things look like crap, but that doesn't mean it's over, right? Or as you know, Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over, right? Um, so this is not obviously, and again, I don't need to preach to you, right? I mean, this is the, the worst time to start you know, to, to give up and take your marbles and go home, right? This is when we have to fight the most. So thanks a lot for listening.
it's, I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm going to uh, ask if anybody's got any questions. And we'll do a little bit of questions from the audience here and, and questions from, uh, from Zoom. So thanks again. OK, yes, sir. Yeah, right. Well, there there are no lobsters there, but the crabs they've got the they've got these these regular old claws. Yeah, you know we've actually done some. So the question was 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 if there are lobsters there, um, do they have claws? The answer is yes. Well, they, there are no lobsters there. The crabs, those king crabs, they have these very robust claws that look just like a lobster claw. And we've actually done some work on the the material properties, like kind of gone into the, sort of the engineering end of things, like material science. And, and we've looked at the claws, and it turns out that the shell on the back, it's like rubber, but, but the claws are just exactly the same as a claw of a, of a regular old crab that you would see in the north. Yes? Are those invasive predatory crabs present in Florida? No. No, they're not. No. No, they're, uh, they're king crabs. I've, I've actually even been, they're small little things. I've been asked by some fishing concerns, hey, I saw that maybe we could go fish for them. I was like, yeah, yeah, if you want like a little tiny thing, yeah. No, they're not. You don't see them in Florida. There are other kinds of crustaceans in the deep sea. They're like squat lobsters. Uh, off here, there are these, these crazy coral beds you've probably heard about. There are some, some other kinds of crustaceans on there. Another question. Yes, sir. So the question is, is it possible that the, that, the, that the Antarctic circumpolar current is weakening, and that's how the larvae are getting through? I have not seen anything about, about a change in the, in, the, in the strength of the drift. So, so I, I mean, I, I, tentatively, I'll give you a tentative. I don't know. But I, yeah. What does that mean? Is it because it's global water temperature, or is it just sucking water, like polar water, into it? Is that why? It's no, it's just. It's just well, the question is, is it, you know, is how, you're asking how this warming is happening. Well, there, there's some element of heat transfer, there's some element of heat transfer in the world ocean, but basically, you know, the poles, the poles are, are, are warming for the same reason as, as the rest of the world, greenhouse effect. Curiously enough, the ozone hole acts against the greenhouse effect, but there are some obvious problems about that, like in Southern Chile, the kids can't go out for more than Rich, yeah, we had a question from the Zoom audience. Uh, why aren't the deep sea king crabs impacted by that magnesium issue? And give me just a second to turn my mic off. It sounds like only one of us can talk at the same time. OK, yeah, here we go. Yeah, so so I, everybody's heard the question, including on Zoom, I'm sure. So um, so the question is, is are they, they are, why are they not impacted by the, um, by, by the magnesium problem? They are impacted, but to a lesser extent than, than true crabs and lobsters and some of these other things. It's just, again, an accident of evolution. So they're able to, they're able to, to exist down, you know, at slightly lower temperatures than regular little crabs. But again, it's not like they're running around and, uh, you know, having a tea party. They're, they're sitting there in a torpid state. They're just kind of hanging out. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> you in the back with the blue shirt. Yes. I've got another Zoom question. Uh, it says, I'm from Queens, New York also, and I'm moving to Melbourne next month and hoping to enroll at Florida Tech for grad school. I was just wondering how Dr. Aronson got a start in the field. Did I get my start in the field? Well, you know, it's um, again. I was when I was a little kid. I was collected clamshells on Jones Beach a lot, and I just always loved seashells. And uh, you know, it's, it's odd. I never did rocks or fossils until adulthood, and then I got all crazy about them too. But but um, you know, I, I I got my start on Jones Beach, and and uh, and uh, just got interested in it from truly from watching TV, and so so. TV is not all bad, you know. <laughs> Tell your kids and your grandkids watch plenty of TV. You know, it's educational. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, 
Well, let me, oh yes, so the question is, is are, are there differences in the response of ecosystems at the poles and the tropics? I mean, it's, you know, at, at this point, what I'm, what I'm trying to, you know, I, I mean, the suites of organisms that are there are different. The, the plants and animals there are different. Um, the, the kinds of interactions to begin with, you know, before we even think about global, global climate change are, are different. Um, it's interesting, I, I mean, I, I'm gonna answer this kind of by example. What, what's interesting about coral reefs is that everybody thinks corals, it, 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 I'll tell you a similarity, everybody thinks, well, corals would just migrate from, let's say from the Caribbean to go up the west, to the east and west coast of Florida and, you know, and spend their summers on the Jersey shore. Well, it's not gonna happen for a whole variety of reasons. One of the reasons is that um, that there's, there's less shelf area to, to have a coral reef as you move north. Another is geochemistry. So you go from, a, from a, a, a limestone environment to a glassy environment, right around here actually, and, and further north. So, so the, 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 the kinds of considerations, I guess to answer your question, the, 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 the details, they're different, but the basic principles are the same. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're running out of space, corals, they're running out of places to live. It's like when you think about, about the side of a mountain in the tropics as it gets warmer, right? The plant, suites of plants, they move up the mountain, right? And eventually they're gonna be at the tippy top. They're gonna to be, there's no place to go. And it's just like, the, like penguins trying to make it down the peninsula. Yes, Zach. Another question from Zoom. Uh is the warming of the ocean likely to result in any changes in upwelling patterns of water around Antarctica? That is, don't wait for the, yeah, that's, so, the, so that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Probably it is. So one of the things that happens when, when you warm an ocean is that the top of the ocean you know, gets, gets warmer faster than the bottom. And what that does is it sets up stratification, which is to say you get this, parcel of water on the top and a parcel on the bottom. It's like, you know, everybody knows when you go into a, into a lake up north and you dive down in a couple of feet, all of a sudden it's cold, right? And, and there's, um, that's actually only like half a degree or something like that, but it feels just so much colder. And that sets up what's called thermal resistance to mixing. So that means, that means it's much harder for the water to overturn. So upwelling is as may be, I, you know, it's, it's hard to know what upwelling is going to do as it gets warmer, but chances are, you know, it could weaken. So that's, that's the answer that I could, could give to that. I mean, again, it's speculation. Yes, sir. So the question is if, if fish are moving north in Florida, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, would they move south? The answer is yes, they move poleward, right? So, so you know, it's not just north is north, right? right so, yeah. right, so it's, it's, it's their mirror polar. images. Yeah, that's exactly correct, yeah. Yes, sir. So the question is, are there ecosystems that the Antarctic will come to resemble? And I'd say yes, I, I think that, you know, I think we could be looking at, at the peninsula starting to take on some characteristics of Southern and South America. And then the other side, perhaps on a much longer scale because it's further away from the, the rest of the world, uh, starting to take on, take on communities that look something like New Zealand. Yes. question is, is, there, is Antarctica warm enough is that there's a significant melting of snow and ice? The answer is yes. Um, one of the things that's happening is these great big ice sheets are busting up. They're breaking up. And that's one of the things I've worked on. Um, you know, and so you get these, these in, insanely huge icebergs. You know, the, the, you know, everything's in Antarctica, at least up until recently, is the size of Rhode Island, right? So something the size of Rhode Island. In the Amazon, it's always the size of Switzerland. In Antarctica, just so you know, in case you read something, right? You know, it's always the size of Switzerland in the Amazon, and it's the size of 
Rhode Island in Antarctica. But I mean, you get, I'm just kidding around, but you get these monstrous breakups of these ice sheets. Now, that's ice that's already sitting on the water, right? So it floats away and melts. That's not a big deal. But what the problem is that, is that those, those ice sheets hold the glaciers in check. And when they go away, then the glaciers are going to start tumbling down. And that's when we're going to have a problem. That's one of the things that's going on in Greenland, and it's, it's happening as well in, uh, in, uh, in Antarctica. The glaciers are, the ice sheets and the glaciers both are starting to soften up and fall into the sea. So are there going to be glaciers for Yes, there are. And that, that will contribute to this sort of locking the upper and lower layers in place. Because there's not only resistance to mixing them because of temperature, but also because of salinity, right? Because if there's a lot of fresh water, it just sits there on the top, and you, it's hard to mix it down. All right, folks, if, uh, if we don't have any other questions, I'd like to give Dr. Aronson one more big round of applause. And uh, just a reminder to all of you, we're going to see you here again, hopefully, in one week from tonight to learn about uh, dolphins in the Bahamas. But I have a challenge for everybody. I'd like all of you to bring somebody with you. And everybody on Zoom, I'd like you to send an invite to a friend. I, I really want to get as big of an audience as possible, both here at the Blake Library and uh, on Zoom. So I hope everybody had a great night tonight. Rich, thank you again. Awesome presentation. Bye, everybody.